students of indigenous settler relations uh, uh, in the pre-confederation period uh, typically rely on three sets of sources. Um, on the one hand, we have the documentary record left for the most part by Europeans uh, themselves. And these could be explorers, journals. These could be the uh, reports of a missionary. Uh, these could be the account books of uh, a trader. Uh, this could be the correspondence of a colonial official. Um, so we have all these these records uh, preserved um, in archives in Europe and also in North America. Um, we also have the archaeological record, um, which uh, is interpreted for historians at least by, by the specialists, the archaeologists. And so um, this gives us great insight into uh, things like settlement patterns um, of both indigenous groups and Europeans. Um, uh, population change, um, and material culture. Um, uh, the trick is, of course, that the archaeological record is in many ways mute about what people were thinking uh, or feeling, uh, what their plans were, what their hopes were. Um, so um, so uh, we have to infer those sometimes, or try to infer those from the material remains that people have left behind, and that's immense challenge for archaeologists and for historians interpreting archaeological uh, analyses. It's even more difficult. Um, and then a final set of sources that we can rely on are uh, oral traditions uh, and oral histories. Um, um, for the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, um, uh, these are uh, few uh, in number. Um, and for many First Nations today, uh, those eras are not um, foregrounded in the present day oral tradition. Um, uh, or at least the, the specific events of those eras are not, uh, are not um, prominent in oral traditions. Um, nevertheless, um, the, those sources are very valuable. Um, because they give us a sense of an indigenous perspective um, on, on early contact. Um, so one great example uh, of those are 19th century Anishinaabe traditions, oral traditions about the arrival of, of French and English uh, traders in the Great Lakes region. Um, and whereas uh, you know, French and English documentary records uh, really highlight the, the, uh, the, the uh, action of the Europeans in, in exploring and pushing further into un, un, undiscovered areas and mapping new territories and encountering new peoples, um, the Anishinaabe oral tradition um, reverses the situation. And instead, uh, in, in different, in different uh, traditions, um, Anishinaabe um, uh, shamans or um, elders uh, foresee the arrival of Europeans, that is, and, and in some cases go out to find them and bring them uh, to, uh, to their villages, to their, their homelands. In other words, it's, it's in many ways it's the Anishinaabe who discover the French and the English rather than the, the reverse. Um, uh, and uh, um, the, uh, the same oral traditions also give us a sense of, of uh, how those early encounters were, were remembered uh, afterwards. Sometimes uh, uh, there's an element of humor in them, uh, humor at perhaps the appearance of the Europeans themselves, who were, looked strange and dressed oddly and had hair on their faces and things like that. Um, sometimes uh, humor directed at uh, indigenous tellers of these traditions themselves. In other words, um, listeners of these, of these stories would be encouraged to, uh, to see the humor in their ancestors um, seeing a, a gun for the first time and being astonished at the report, or um, not knowing what to do with an axe head and instead of putting it on a on a on a ha instead of hafting it and using it to cut down a tree, they would wear it uh, around their neck as a as a necklace. So things like that. Those elements of misunderstanding, early misunderstanding, which um, which were recorded as being humorous uh, moments. 
Um, and sometimes these oral traditions also uh, uh, include cautionary elements. Um, uh, they might point, and again, these are because traditions are, are oral traditions are kept alive because they are useful in the present. Um, some of these traditions encode information about the potential duplicity of Europeans, uh, asking for a little bit of land, for example, but then taking a much larger piece of land. And so there, are, these oral traditions preserved for First Nations a, a sense of caution in dealing with the newcomers. Uh, um, so, um, so those are, are three sets of sources. So they're all um, uh, important, equally important. Certainly the, the strength of the documentary record is its, um, its specificity. Um, documents can, can put specific people in specific places at exact times. And so they allow us to construct um, a chronology of, of encounters. Uh, and we can understand how relationships developed over time, how they broke down, when conflict began, how conflict was ended, and so on and, and so forth. Um, the limitation, of course, of the documentary record is that it's, it's completely one-sided. It's, it's partial in, in, in both senses of the words. It's only part of the story, and it's also partial because it's, it em embraces all the biases and the prejudices of the European observers, you know, some of whom, as we know, saw indigenous peoples as, as primitive, as lacking uh, uh, culture, um, lacking religion, um, lacking civilization. So, so that's a severe limitation uh, of, of that source. Uh, I've already mentioned some of the limitations of the archaeological um, record. Um, and as far as the oral tradition goes, um, uh, its principal limitation is just that it's, uh, there are so few that relate to early periods of contact.